In season one, we talked about maintaining the boundaries the Lord has ordained so that in our lives, we're able to protect our inheritance of peace. Today, we'll hear from Colin Fraser, the owner of 360radio.com, an exclusively Christian radio station. Colin shares a shocking and illuminating perspective on boundaries and keeping peace with his God. He is viscerally passionate about prison ministry and has been a leader with Blacks in government for the last eight years. Colin tackles secular young adult culture using a biblical worldview through Christian hip hop. Stay tuned. Shauna Knox, and this is Further, where we explore the real Christ and the real you. The way to life is extremely narrow, and very few of us ever even find it. But let's keep looking. We'll do it together. experience of coming to Jesus is among the most compelling I've ever heard. Why don't we start there? Can you share with the Further family that incredible story? So 2008, I was shot eight times, Mm -hmm. uh, once in the face, one in the back of the head, three times in the arm, twice in the abdomen, and probably a couple other places I can't remember. Mm -hmm. But it all started out when I came to a place when I thought that money could buy you anything. Hmm. I mean, I always, I was in the church. I grew up in the church. Aunts is pastors, uncles are pastors. Hmm. Um, It just came to a realization that I wanted to, I guess, work smarter, not harder. And quote unquote, drugs was the was the way to do it. Mm-hmm. I found myself in a situation where I had an opportunity that we were moving about six to eight hundred pounds of marijuana a week mm-hmm. up and down the East Coast. So it would be the reason why we moved it so fast. You would think of Costco being a wholesaler. Mm-hmm. So then you want to think, well, where does Costco get his stuff from? So we were the suppliers to Costco. Wow. Why we were able to move things so fast? Six to eight hundred pounds. Yeah, and you know, at at this time, you know, we're we're gaining anywhere from a hundred and thirty to hundred and seventy five thousand dollars a week, and I wasn't even twenty one yet. Mm. So being able to go down to Vegas and watch the Mayweather and Oscar De La Hoya fight, mm-hmm. um, I wasn't even supposed to be on the floor, but I'm able to pay my way into these things, mm-hmm. um, taking trips to Miami, just doing whatever I wanted mm-hmm. um, at that point. So what had happened was, you know. I'm getting tired of this. Hmm. So it had been a Sunday, actually. My mom calls me, and it's like, you know, come to church. And, you know, mom hadn't called me in a while. I'm in and out the house or whatever. So I'm like, Mm -hmm. yeah, you know, I get there when I get there. Mm -hmm. So this is the last deal the night before I had got a call. Um, You know, a a guy who called me was like, yo, you know, I got this deal. Um, You know, at this time, I was really... um, putting distance between the street life and kind of trying to get my life back together. I sat down in my office at this office job and saw my first paycheck for two weeks and it was like $400. Mm. And I was like, man. Not 100000 Right. I was like, <laughs> man, I could like, you know, go out here and make two swerves and, you know, quadruple this. Yeah. So, you know, I get the call and I'm like, you know, this is my last, this is my last deal or whatever the case may be. Mm-hmm. So this is right after your mom invited you to church that Sunday. Correct, right? Okay. 
So now fast forward now, I get the invitation. I'm like, yeah, whatever. Um, you know, I go ahead and make the deal. This had been on a Sunday around 3 o'clock. Mm-hmm. You know, park up in that um, alley with me and a buddy of mine from school. Which is typical. That's right, right, style. right, right, right. Mm-hmm. And boom, just a barrage of gunfires. Mm-hmm. I mean, at the at the scene, they said they found 16 shell casings. And this is from a 45. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you have like a 45, then after, then you get to the Desert Eagle. So that 45 bullet, people get hit one time and it's done. This is a serious gun. Correct. How how typical is that that so, that you would be like that people would get into that violent of a situation? That's a good question. It depends on the type of lifestyle you live in. Mm-hmm. You know, I was never one. I, I just like to enjoy the party life. So me, I was making my money and I was in the club spending. You were on the violent side, right? I wasn't you were there on running the up on people. Entrepreneurship side, correct? But then, so that was shocking for yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, definitely. But I knew, you know, you either they, what they call is like a juxman. Which mm-hmm. is, you know, you're robbing, mm-hmm. you're stealing, or, you know, you're out there getting money. You mm-hmm. know, so it's, it's different players to the game. Gotcha. You know, so it's to be expected, but I definitely wasn't expecting it that day and the type of life I was living. Mm-hmm. You know, I wasn't expecting You thought you that. were doing it in a way that was safer. Right. Mm-hmm. But envy is always the biggest monster. Mm-hmm. So what happened, this guy who had set me up for this, I used to buy pampers for his daughter. You know, I used to bring detergent to his house when he was on house arrest and everything. Wow. So he was the one who I would least expect right. to set this thing up. Wow. So after, you know, the big shootout happens, um, I jump back in the car and I speed off. So you I drive. drove away with eight shots. Right. So I drove to Howard University. So I was about seven blocks um, from the hospital. So I was just running through red lights, mm-hmm. get to the front, park the car, mm-hmm. and walk into the walk into the emergency into the With into the eight lobby. Shots Correct. in your body. Correct. So and I could still see the nurse's face to this day. She was on the phone and I just said help. And she just pointed to the to the stretcher and I just laid across the stretcher. Next mm. thing you know, I saw the mask over my face and then mm. that was it. So yeah. I happened to be in a um, medically induced coma for about three days. Three days. I wake up, just got this excruciating pain in my arm. Mm-hmm. So what happened, I had one bullet come in the left side of my arm and exit out the right side and broke my whole radius bone. Mm. So I had these um, metal bars in my wrist and in my elbow to keep the bone back together because mm. um, I had to regrow all new bone or at least or they were going to do a, a bone graft in my thigh and take a piece of bone out mm-hmm. and kind of fuse it together. So at this point, I'm in the hospital bed. Uh, my mouth is wired shut because the bullet who, that came in my face shattered the right side of my jaw mm. and the other bullet that came in my face shattered the uh, uh, right side of my eye socket. So the right side of my face was just shattered mm-hmm. and then uh, wired shut because there was no way to do any type of surgery because the bones were like specks mm-hmm. in my face. Shattered. So at this point now, I'm waking up and I'm seeing all this. My first instinct was let me call the nurse so i called the nurse Mm -hmm. and i'm telling her i need a phone Mm -hmm. because i wanted to call my cousins who had ran with the crips to come down from new york and just murder this guy so i needed that it was your friend who you helped to die first. yeah who had set me up so my my thing was like i want his daughter dead i want his girlfriend dead i knew Mm. exactly where he lived if i couldn't remember anything i knew exactly where this guy laid his head and I wanted their whole family dead. Revenge. So this was this was my mindset, you know, mm-hmm. in that type of life. My heart was just so callous, mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying? To a place where it was like, you know, I had people before. I was like, man, didn't you hear from God? God didn't give you anything, any kind of signs. Mm-hmm. At this point, I strayed so far away from God. Right. He was like, I'm going to let you run up in this brick wall, and then you're going to figure it out, you know, afterwards. <laughs> so I had spent about... About seven days in the hospital. At this point, I couldn't walk really because I've been laid up in the bed. Of Did course, I couldn't the phone? talk. Did you call your cousin? Nah, I, they couldn't even understand me. Oh. I was talking gibberish. Wow. You know, I could understand what I wanted to say, yeah. but they couldn't hear anything because yeah. I was still hemorrhaging blood from my nose wow. and from my mouth. So it was like I really couldn't form the words. So properly. you knew you were really unwell, and you were willing to let your last thing be. I'm not calling my mom. 
I'm going to take care of this. Well, I, I didn't want to let my mom know I was selling drugs, you yeah. know, and she knew, let alone I'm shot up in somebody's hospital. Me. Right, yeah. exactly. So now, uh, laid up in the hospital for seven days, and they put me in a wheelchair, and they're like, well, you know, you got to come down to the precinct for some questioning. Mm. So I get down to the precinct, and the detective tells me, well, you're facing uh, first-degree murder charge. I'm like, wait, what? Mm. So your buddy of mine who I went to school was murdered, mm -hmm. and they pin, they're trying to pin the murder on me. This is the same guy who set you up? Is also no, this is my this is my friend who I came along with me to actually do this transaction. So he was a part of the setup. Correct. Wow. No, he wasn't a part of the setup. He was a part of the deal. So he was with me. Uh -huh. Yeah. So he had nothing to do with it. So then now, the laws clearly state that if you're committing a felony mm -hmm. and somebody dies, you're responsible for that person's death. So even if we had been selling drugs on a felony case, if he would have slipped and hit his head and died. Mm -hmm. I would have been responsible for his murder. That's murder. That's murder. So, you know, of course I didn't know this, so I'm denying the whole thing because, of course, I didn't kill the guy. You right. understand? I was busy trying to get to the hospital to save my life. Right. So right then and there, straight to the precinct. This time I could barely walk. I'm still under. I mean, the pain was so crazy. They had to, um, they had put the insert in my chest to just You're administer. You're in the police station? Yeah, they took me straight from the hospital straight to the police station. But squad you're not car, well everything. yet. They're just taking yeah, I was still dopey. Too every bad day. for you. So they took me to the police station for questioning me, and then after that, they shipped me straight off to the um to the cell. So wow. then went straight to DC jail after that, uh, processing everything like that. So I'm in there now for mm. well, my first night in there. I'm in a ward where it's 23 and 1. So that means you're locked up for 23 hours of the day and you can only come out for one hour. Even but this, in the state that you were in, right. they locked you up for 23. Oh, yeah. Wow. So that one hour, you can't even really come outside the jail. You could just only come out to take a shower, Why go and watch TV. Why the severity of the 23 and 1? Because of the charge. Okay. So I was facing about 15 charges at this point now. Okay. So it was first degree murder, intent to sell, distribution, gun charge. The list goes on. So I'm like, like, this guy's just bad. Correct. So yeah. whatever state he's in, he's still a threat. You gotcha. understand? Can't walk, face swole. Mm -hmm. Can't walk. So, you know. Um, so, um, so I'm in the jail the first night. And the crazy thing about D.C. jail is that the type of war that we're in, no matter where you look outside this window, is cemetery. Hmm. So it's, you can't, it's cemetery. Hmm. You just, you can't look anywhere without seeing cemetery. So this one particular night, it was like super hot inside the cell. And I'm like, man, I got to take off these clothes. And I go reach behind my head and peel off this, um, the scab. And when I look at the scab, it's like the size of a quarter. Hmm. And then I started reaching toward my arm and peeling off that scab. And that's the size of like a 50 cent piece, the way how this thing just dug out my skin. Mm -hmm. And when I was in the hospital, I didn't know how badly I was wounded. Right. You know, and I you started didn't look counting. in a mirror. Right, right. Mm -hmm. And nobody told me, you mm -hmm. know. And he said, well, sir, you've been shot eight times, whatever, whatever. I guess because it was an ongoing thing.